Hello, late night listeners. Uh, this is Brian, and I wanted to let you know that we have a Patreon. It's a really fun thing. It's a great way to support the show, and it gets you access to all kinds of exclusive stuff. We have exclusive mini episodes. We have videos of me, for example, writing music for various things of the show. Leighton's doing all sorts of stuff, and it's just a really fun community. You also get access to our Discord if you sign up for our $5 a month tier or up. So uh, if you like the show and you like what you hear, please check us out over on Patreon. It's really a great way to to support us. Thanks so much. And enjoy Late Night with Brian Wecht. It's my Don Pardo impression. Let me do that one again. You were recording saxophone. I was. Did that sound natural? Uh, no, <laughs> but that's fine. Yeah, I'm working on my smooth jazz album again now that the NSP album is almost out, and I got back to writing, so I was uh, playing some sax. You know, for a long time we've talked about you potentially playing sax on this show. Do we? Do we? Are we going to get any of that ever? Do, I, do you want me to do it now? Yeah, do, right. The fuck now. Let's go. Okay, I have to set it up. <laughs> Welcome to late night, motherfuckers. <laughs> Hey, listeners, what's up? It's me, Leighton. Uh, Brian isn't listening anymore because he's a little too busy uh, getting his careless whisper on. It is 8.03 p.m. on October, whatever the fuck hell day it is. We are actually recording at night for once. And to mark the occasion, I- I'm I'm drinking a Angry Orchard crisp apple cider, which is not good. I don't like these, but uh, oh, he's back. Unless I got a reed in my mouth. This is what I sound like when I talk with a saxophone reed in my mouth. Don't suck on it, please. Sucks. <laughs> what this? Mm. This is not how I wanted to spend my Tuesday evening. Oh, guys! If you like sucking, this is the podcast for you. Now, this might be stupid loud, so I'm gonna have to point away from the mic. <laughs> Was that crazy loud? I mean, yeah, but super enjoyable. Wow. I, I can't shred on this thing, but uh, I used to be pretty good. <laughs> I can't shred. Well, Charlie Parker for you. If I really want to get smooth, you know, you can do like a. Just kind of dicking around. And so that is what a saxophone sounds like. We're vibing. Yeah. That's crazy. I've never heard a saxophone before. <laughs> uh, I used to primarily play alto and berry. And do you know what I mean by that, Layden? Uh Like a baritone? Yes. Yes, a baritone sax. So an alto, a baritone sax is an octave lower than an alto. It's kind of the, the biggest, the deepest saxophone most people play. There are There's a bass also, but that's less common. But in a typical like band band, you'll see a berry sax. Mm. And that's an octave lower than a, an alto. And what I'm playing right now is a soprano, which is, I'm not going to get too technical, but roughly half an octave higher than an alto. Hmm. And in between alto and berry is tenor. In a typical sax quartet, it's soprano, alto, tenor, berry. I really appreciate a sax quartet's commitment to just like, these are going to be some smooth farts for the next 60 minutes, however long, God knows. There's some great saxophone quartet stuff. I wrote some in college. That was not among the great stuff. But they're like a good sax quartet can really sound cool. Yeah, I, I used to play sax quartet stuff all the time. I'm not dissing a, a sax quartet. It sounds great. I'm into that. I just happen to be drinking on a Tuesday night. So, you know, trying it out, getting aggro or five minutes in. Do you want to hear the lowest note I can play? By the way, if anyone's new to the podcast, this is a terrible introduction. <laughs> Get out of here. It's not all like this. Go back to listening to This American Life. Just get out of here. <laughs> Goodbye. Your time is better spent. Listen to last week's show with Jonathan Young. It's much better. All right, here's the lowest note I can play. Uh. <laughs> <laughs>
That's it. Are you sure? Are you sure that's the lowest one? Yep. I don't know about that. That's the highest. There it is. I know a lot about music theory, and that's definitely lower than the other one that you played. It's a high F. Hey, my tinnitus is back. Lots of terrible, terrible things you can do with a saxophone. Cut this out, Jarek, because it's that's no, no. Leave it in. Leave it in. Leave it in. <laughs> Jarek, leave it in, or you're fired. <laughs> that's a good way to start too, is by threatening our wonderful producer, Jarek. All right, that's probably enough saxophone. Yeah, guys, enjoy the rest of this episode, which is about two hours of uncut us just rambling because Jarek is gone now. Rest in pieces. <laughs> We salute you, Jarek. Um, hi, Brian. What? This is for Jarek. That was really beautiful. You know, I, I'm not sure how people listen to this podcast if they listen to it sequentially as they come out, but I'm trying to imagine like a harsher, you know, back to back of, oh, here's a really like vulnerable kind of introspective episode about, you know, the the nature of being visible online and creating work online. And then this, welcome. <laughs> it's just me and Brian this week. What's up? Yep. Our guest found out I was going to be playing saxophone and backed out. Yeah, that was probably the wise choice. Um so yeah, we are actually recording at night for once, which congratulations us. Way to go. It's nice. It's a uh, late night after dark. It feels uh, a little looser, <laughs> a little more intimate. Relaxed fit. Oh, late night relaxed fit. Are you kidding me? I Okay, I can't steal that. that that's a last podcast thing where they will occasionally refer to episodes as the relaxed fit episodes. Oh, I like that a lot. I can picture the graphic, like the image, which is, you know, some sort of baggy jeans. I was imagining like, you know, the the like Wrangler, like Levi jeans, like little patch that they put on them, that, but late night relaxed fit. Oh, yeah. Somebody with too much time on your hands, please conjure that from the ether, i.e. through Photoshop. In college, I used to be known amongst my small group of friends, and I emphasize small, as <laughs> having the baggiest jeans in town. And I was able to fit a large number of objects down my pants and then pull them out sequentially. So it became something of a contest in my crazy youth to see how many large objects I could fit down my pants. And let's just say everybody was always surprised and impressed. Now, I got to know a little bit more about this. Are we talking some cargo pants? Are we talking some flare leg? These were uh, relaxed fit jeans. You know, baggy, like mid-90s jeans, a look that was probably not popular then either, but I liked. I would often wear them, and I'm really not kidding here. I, I don't know if I posted a picture of this. I don't know if I have a picture with this. I would wear them with, uh, this is so awful to say, uh, Tevas and socks white athletic socks. This was my assumption. The only way you could have surprised me is if you were like, yeah, they were super low rise with like a whale tail thong sticking out, you know. Yes. Like the true artists of our time in the early 2000s did. God bless them. Definitely not. So this is, you know, let's let's call it 94, 95 through 97, 98-ish. For me, college was, I graduated in 97. So like that, you know, early to mid 90s. So I'd wear these baggy, not quite acid washed, but close to it, jeans, uh, no belt, crucially, brown Tevas. This is, by the way, in college, I was in Massachusetts for a large part during the winter. During the winter, I would wear Timberland boots because my father's store sold them and I could get them for free. So I would wear those. But during the warmer months, 
I would wear Tevas with white socks. And then this is before hoodies were like a thing. So I didn't really have hoodie sweatshirts, just t-shirts with some kind of terribly colored button down Oxford shirt over them. Uh, also hair down to my waist, nice, big, thick, round glasses, you know, the full package. Now, a true serve, as the kids would say. Yes, indeed. It's going to come as a surprise that I didn't date much in college. But I mean, believe me, I was surprised too. I mean, with all that shit you're pulling out of your pants. You know, this raises a more important question of what's the funniest thing besides dick that you've ever pulled out of your pants? Uh, is dick funny? That's a good question. I mean, I guess I based a career on the assumption that it is, but... You made this bed. Yeah. You made this dick bed. <laughs> Why in it? Let's see. Uh, I believe a paperback copy of Weathering Heights out of my pants <laughs> at one point. Um, several juggling pins, like several juggling pins. A full-size Opus the Penguin doll from Bloom County. Oh, a mic stand, a full-size uh, straight mic stand. Assembled? Yeah. I mean, it was sticking out maybe a little bit, but it was like shrunk down. Yeah, I'd say I'd say the Wuthering Heights probably was the the best thing I can think of. Yeah. God forbid you pull anything out of your pants that say violates like OSHA rules, like then you're really in trouble with the paint union. Oh no, no, no. Big pant trying to keep us proles <laughs> down. <laughs> Despite being in a bunch of physics labs <laughs> in during college, they did not let me near like the dangerous shit, which physics labs don't really have. Well, at least undergraduate physics labs don't really have anyway. Like liquid nitrogen is the most dangerous thing you're going to find. I mean, I would argue that gravity can be pretty fucking dangerous. Well, that's true, but that's everywhere, not just in labs. I'm so intrigued by this image. Now, what was the the storage mechanism of holding these? Op I'm sorry that I'm so fixated on this, but it, how? Just shoved them right the fuck down there, and they stayed. What else can I say? It was there was no mechanism. And did you walk around with them? Was it just like a you're getting prepped, and then you do your bit, or did you just have that locked and loaded? No, that's a good that's a good question. I wasn't like walking around with these things in my pants. What I would do is wait in my dorm room or suite, like prepped, and then people would walk in and I would say something along the lines of, hey, check this out, and then just start pulling shit out of my pants. It became something of a spectator sport at some point. I don't like to brag again. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to make myself sound super, super cool here. I apologize if I'm coming off that way. All the kids are standing around in a semicircle throwing dollars on the ground. Hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was my art. It was the thing that I was the undisputed champion of at Williams College in the mid-90s. Wow. That and I also, <laughs> I think I might have told you this, I requested the same song so often at the radio station that they pulled it from the stacks. And that was uh, Maynard Ferguson's interpretation of the theme to Star Wars. Jesus Christ, Brian. Which my buddy Norm turned me on to. And I, thinking I was being quite the little scamp, called every radio show <laughs> for the space of several days and requested it. And eventually radio management, by the way, I was a DJ at the time too. So I not only played it on my show, I called everybody else's show. Making friends. Yeah. Well, and uh, at some point, the manager of the radio station hit it so that <laughs> I and other DJs would not have access to it. I mean, that's your like watershed, uh, what's new pussycat and one it's not unusual uh, situation mm -hmm. going there. That's exactly right. Well, okay. So if you were in the John Mulaney bit where you were playing this over and over in the salt and pepper diner, what is your, it's not unusual, break it up and then lull them into a false sense of security track. The track I would use to lull them into a false sense of, that's the question. Before going right back to whatever the fuck you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, for people who don't know this bit, this is the thing that you... You do this one thing over and over, and then you do something else, and then you go back to the original thing. Yeah. Also, guys, if you haven't heard the John Mulaney bit, I, John Mulaney is really popular now, so I'm sure most people have heard it, but the John Mulaney salt and pepper diner bit, one of the funniest stand-up bits, it's a classic. Go listen to it. It's important context. Yeah. So originally, the track is Maynard Ferguson's theme from Star Wars. I might throw in Maynard Ferguson's theme from Star Trek to really throw people off the scent. He did a bunch of sci-fi themes, including Battlestar Galactica as well. So I would say probably that. Maybe an Esquivel, just to really mix it up. I'll accept that one. Yayo being my favorite 
Esquivel track. Do you know Yayo? Have we talked about this? I probably do. I, I was big into him when I was a kid because my dad was into them. And I actually, to the point of, oh my God, dad, you're probably listening to this, which A, please don't. B, when I was a child, we had like this project about, I might've been 10 and it was like a meteorology kind of weather bullshit. And so my my class partner and I wrote lyrics to an Esquivel song that I do not remember but it was like going through the steps for condensation and precipitation. And honestly, it was a bop. That's excellent. So yeah, Father, God, why do you do that? Please just, I don't know, text me. God. The Esquivel song that I'm referring to is Yayo, Y-E-Y-O. And the lyrics go, oh, yayo, 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 yayo. Oh, yayo, 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 yay. Oh, yayo, 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 yay. Oh, yay, oh, yayo, oh, yay, oh, yay. Something oh, close to that. So the only word is Yayo, basically, and it's awesome. Yep, I have heard this. It's great. It's one of his, I think, more popular ones. Fabulous. I always think of the most popular Esquivel song as Mucho Muchacha, but I'm not. I'm not convinced that's actually true. I don't know what his big hit, if he had a big hit even, was. I've been re-listening to the same shit over and over too much lately just because my brain literally cannot process new information. You know, every year in October, it's the goal to watch 31 horror movies. Not, you know, one every night, but, you know, you double up, you quadruple up, whatever. It's October. Uh, <sighs> Sorry, you were saying. I have not watched a single horror movie this month, except for maybe Possessor. What? That's just shocking in general for you in any month. Yeah, it's called I Have Clinical Depression and also Our Democracy is at Stake. So I'm not really, not really in the mood. I would have thought that would have been your escape. That's interesting. I watched Borat. Borat and Possessor were my two <laughs> movies for this month. And now I'm so far into the month that unless I spend the rest of it just solid marathoning horror movies, which I don't have the attention span for, which like, how many movies did I watch last year? I watched like 85 Whoa. Somewhere between 85 and 100 movies last year. And like, Fuck. how did I do that? Well, I'll tell you because you, you don't have kids. <laughs> don't have kids, smoke a lot of weed, clinically depressed. So, you know, it's a perfect storm of watching too many movies. Anyway, now maybe I'll watch one more movie. I don't know. Every year I'm like, ah, oh, October, it's going to be Halloween. It's, it's, this is my vibe. And then it gets here and I'm like, I'm tired to call me next year. If you could pick one movie to see for the rest of the month. Like, you're going to watch it every day for the rest of the month. What is that movie? Could be something you've seen before. Could not. It's something that I would want to, like, become a student of, you know? Like, if I'm going to rewatch it that obsessively, it needs to be something, A, that I've either never seen before, B, something I fucking hate and want to pull a um, The Worst Idea Ever podcast style situation with it. Mm -hmm. As with any of those Desert Island questions, it's like, what thing do I like enough that I'm willing to ruin it forever in this hypothetical situation? I don't know. Maybe John Carpenter's seminal 1982 classic, The Thing? I, I don't know. <laughs> Mentioned at least five times per episode on this podcast. Yes, that's a good choice. By the way, do you guys like Taco Bell? Uh, blue, uh, I have bad relationships. Uh, the weed. All right. Well, okay. Bad relationships. I feel like you don't talk about bad relationships too much or as much as the other ones. Sure. I, I, maybe that's not true. That's my guess. Oh, they're living rent-free in my head, baby. Do you want to discuss any particular ones now? That could be a fun way to spend the rest of this podcast. You know, Brian, I stopped going to therapy for a reason. <laughs> it can be with a sound effect. I, I'm like setting these up for you to fucking... I'm going to do that read again. Brian, I stopped going to therapy for a reason. <laughs> and that reason was that... You love talking about these so much. This is the worst. This is fucking awful. You get the soundboard. You use the soundboard at inopportune times. And then I, I tee you up. Just easy, easy comedy. I'm going to leave this show. I swear to God, one day, one day I'm just going to walk out and it's going to be an hour of Brian playing saxophone and talking about, I don't know, calf high white socks. <sighs> yeah, that's about right. Calf high. That's right. Usually gold toe. I would do the gold toes. When I was younger, they'd have the, the two brightly colored stripes, usually red or green. I only started wearing dark socks, I'm going to say in my late 20s. This is interesting to precisely nobody. But I only started wearing dark socks because I was 
this is going to sound like such a douchey thing to say. I was traveling to Europe enough for work for physics that I was like, if I wear white socks all the time, people are just going to mercilessly hound me. So maybe I should get used to dark. You know what I mean? And so were you continuing to wear the dark socks with, you know, shorts, Tevas? For a long time, you might be even too young to remember this. It was very uncool to wear dark socks with shorts. Like, very uncool. Oh, but it was really fucking hip to wear white ones? It was like the the standard thing for a while, at least. Also, I'm completely the wrong person to ask about this, but there there was definitely a period of time, which was most of my life until I'll, I'd say maybe five years ago, where if you were wearing dark socks with shorts, you were either A, old, or B, German. And <laughs> that was kind of it. And now it's like the thing. The first time I saw a young, hip-looking person wear like tight, you know, like khaki shorts with dark socks within the last five years, I was like, I cannot believe this is like a legit look now. When I was told my entire life, never wear this really upset me. And now of course I'm fine with it. I really appreciate that at this stage, it's just everyone embracing like ugly combos, you know, for comfort's sake. Yeah. I do resent, however, that, you know, if you were like mid teens before, like most social media was a thing, you slaved in the minds of of just looking like shit, like blue eyeshadow up above your eyebrows for some reason, like the knee length, like plaid Bermuda shorts, gaucho pants. Why did we do gaucho pants for women? What are gaucho pants? Is that a typically a women's thing or a men's thing? Yeah, yeah. They don't look good. Let me, let me look. Oh, this. Yeah, yeah. That looks fine. Oh, okay. But in the context that I'm imagining is me being freshly seven and all the cool girls who are mean to me all have rainbow flip-flops and colored gauchos and like camisoles mm-hmm. from Abercrombie and Fitch. So in case that paints a picture of a very particular time in my life. Anyway, but now kids these days, they all look so put together and I'm pissed about it that these people feel comfortable in their skin at an earlier age than... Well, now everyone's a fucking brand, right? So now everyone has to be together so they can post their pictures on social media. That's the big difference, of course, is that now people are constantly fucking posting pictures of themselves. Look, I I do this too, right? This is part of my (laughs) career, but... Yeah, you're an insta-thought. Yeah, hell yeah, I am. Now you, I feel like you have to look good because you have to be on social media and you have to post pictures of yourself. Of course, I'm overstating the case a bit, but generally that's the way most people behave, right? Yeah, well, and I think it's also the exposure to, like, people outside of your bubble in terms of, like, if you want to look up a makeup tutorial for, like, full beat, total contour, drugstore makeup only, let's go. Like, you can find it instantly, and then you find 16 billion TikToks of, you know, children being like, here's how you do it. I'm a professional makeup artist by my palette. Wow. I think we've really hit all the bases of what makes for a good episode of Late and Night, i.e. bitching about TikTok. <laughs> Well, okay. Speaking of uh, along these lines, I think I sent you one of these. Audrey has started recording videos for something she calls Audrey.com. <laughs> and you know, the first one she did, I knew about because she was in like a box fort. And I said, here, take my phone and just record a video. Like I didn't give her any instruction. I was, I was like, take this phone. I turned it on, like record yourself, just do something. And then we could hear what she was doing. And she went, hi. This is Audrey.com. And today, this is how we're being. And she was talking, she did the, like, hi, this is Audrey.com. And today, things are going to be awesome. And she was doing that cadence of like a vlogger, which is wild to me because we've never let her watch a goddamn vlog in her life. I'm sure she will at some point, but like, this is not part of our regular media consumption. You know, she watches like Octonauts and the Super Mario Brothers Super Show from the 80s. And so the fact that she was nailing the stereotypical cadence of a vlogger and like a young girl vlogger at that, I was like, where is she getting this from? I have no, no, no idea. But the point is that since then, she's recorded several other videos for Audrey.com. I asked her what .com means, and she said, quote, that's just something people in videos say. So she has no idea... (laughs) what that even means, <laughs> which she shouldn't at six, quite frankly. Yeah, thank um, God. These videos to me are simultaneously the cutest thing I've ever seen and profoundly disturbing. Uh, 
because I don't want her to grow up with this expectation of having to like constantly entertain other people. Although to be fair, she's always performing anyway. So that's probably just who she is. Yeah. And both of her parents are performers. I mean, you can straight up say you just don't want your child to become a vlogger. Yeah. Okay. I'll say that on the record. I don't want my child to become a vlogger. Yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah. I, I definitely did a very similar thing. Um, my best friend is a child, Amanda, who Amanda from Dream Daddy is very directly based on. We really loved, of course, the Nickelodeon Amanda Bynes show, The Amanda Show. And so we very frequently did episodes of The Amanda Show, which was our sketch comedy show uh, that just like... Oh, do you have any? You must have some. Thank you, God, YouTube was not like a thing that we were aware of by this point. But do you have any recordings of these? <sighs> I might have some in my email that I can scrounge up to bring up at mm -hmm. a later date. Mm -hmm. But they were they were like all over the place. I recall us getting in really big trouble with Amanda's mom because we, you know, we, we really went like high budget and we threw a very large door of the Explorer doll out the second floor window um, with a parachute on her. And then the, we got in a lot of trouble for that one. We used to tie action figures to the ceiling fan and just kind of like let it go with classical music in the background, slow zoom, and then they would fly off and hit shit on the wall. We were doing some fucking skit or whatever. We were sitting on the back of a bus and to simulate the view from the window of a back of the bus, one of us was playing Mario Kart backwards um, so it was really, we were ahead of our time there. Yeah. I, I kind of did the same thing, although my sister and I would perform little like kind of musical plays when I was in seventh and eighth grade. So this would have been like 88. I did a video presentation on Theseus, the, the Greek legend, um, basically the guy who fights the Minotaur and me and two friends recorded a series of basically comedy sketches reenacting the story of Theseus. This sounds hilarious. I wish I knew where this was. It's on a VHS somewhere. And I had no editing software whatsoever. So we literally just had to, you know, that thing where you like have to start and stop the camera at mm -hmm. judicious points. And uh, yeah, I wish I could find this somewhere. And we showed it to the class. And <laughs> let's just say it didn't make us more popular as I had perhaps envisioned it might. What are you talking about? The kids love Theseus. The children love some, would you classify it as a tragedy? It's not really a tragedy, is it? I can't remember how it ends, but no, I think he's a legendary Greek hero. All right. It just, you know, anytime we can get into a discussion of hubris, love it. Great concept. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking back then. I feel like at some point, my self-perception changed markedly, probably, I feel like after college even, like maybe when I was roughly 22. That seems pretty normal. Okay. I remember for a long time, literally just not thinking about what I would wear. Mm -hmm. Like just literally throw the first thing I found on ratty t-shirt, whatever, like through most of high school, M much to the horror of my mother, by the way. Of course. And then at some point, probably in, in my very early twenties, but definitely after college, probably actually around the same time, this is maybe a driving force of my first like serious relationship. Uh, my girlfriend at the time being like, why do you dress like that? <laughs> and I, I was basically like, like what comfortably, you know? Uh, and she goes, no, like, why do you wear this with this? And this with this? and my only answer was like, I don't know. You know, this is kind of just what I wear. It is things that I put on my body so that I am not naked in public. And then sometimes yeah. I put things in my pants. I don't see why you would have any questions about why I do this. Well, and also remember that my father owned a clothes store. And so I got most of my clothes for free from that store. And that's not to say they were like shitty, you know, like the leftovers. You know, he kind of let me pick out stuff to wear, but I never really cared. So I was wearing free clothes from my dad's store. I say free. He paid for them, but, you know, they were taken from the store. Brian was a chronic shoplifter from his father's own store. This is a real... Yeah, from my family business. <laughs> this is a real Jimmy McGill and Better Call Saul situation. It's a whole tragic thing. Anyway. Yeah, baby! I swear to God, we put out a call for people to email you different sound bites to surprise me. And I know because I get the notifications that we get the email. Do you really not have any in the barrel? I forgot to do it. <sighs> the lack of professionalism in this show is disgusting i have an album coming out this week i've been i've been busy like 
this is a hundred percent my fault. I own it and I admit to it, but too bad. <laughs> How dare you have a successful music career outside of this podcast where it's yeah. us sitting around at 837 on a Tuesday night mm-hmm. talking about how uncool we were as teens yeah. for the fucking 16th episode in a row. Well, I could be putting my daughter to bed, but no. I saw someone write an email about this. We haven't given advice in a while, which is the world is definitely better off for that. <laughs> Absolutely, God. The only real reason we stopped is because it was more fun not to. <laughs> <laughs> the advice kind of interrupted the flow of the conversations with the guests. What we're saying is y'all's contributions to the show really just killed the vibe. It was a real bummer. Well, I guess I am saying that in a sense, but not 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 that the questions were bad or anything. We just liked having the conversations more. So we 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 never explicitly said we're not doing it anymore. We just kind of uh, phased out. Yeah, the thing is that we don't care about the time that you put into writing us the emails. It's just you know that's the fact of the business. God, I, I always worry when I start doing. <laughs> Jarek, <laughs> leave it in. Leave, it, leave that in. Especially if I've been drinking. I'm like, I don't know. Does this scan? Is Brian going to pull me aside after and be like, did I really make you mad? Leighton Gray, bad person. <laughs> All right. So the email we got this week that I want to read, it's from Nita. And basically, it's a lovely long email full of details. And Nita, it's not that you're not a great writer. We just want to you know, keep it compact. I was very touched by the email. It's a very sweet email and you two clearly care about each other a lot. So anyway, Brian continued just reducing this deep, you know, sincere, emotional email that we got down to (laughs) it. Quick little spark notes. Basically, the question is, should Nita encourage her husband to bank on a career as a Let's Player? And if so, how do you start a Let's Play channel? And so she has a career that she's involved in right now and he's kind of stalled and thinking about becoming a Let's Player and maybe aiming to do that as a career. So the question is, how can you encourage him? How can she encourage him? Should she encourage him? Stuff like that. Here's the thing I think people need to know about uh, Let's Play channels, is that like all things in YouTube, it's very hard to make a career at it. And this might come off as unduly negative. I think a Let's Play thing is a great thing as a hobby to start. But just like anything in the arts, if you were like, that's my career, it, well, especially with a YouTube thing, uh, that's going to be really, really challenging to... Algorithmically mercurial is probably the way that I would put it. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, unless you get hugely popular, uh, you're not going to be making any money off of ad revenue. As Leighton said, you're completely at the mercy of YouTube's algorithm. So the way that I would do it, and, and this is absolutely a personal choice, is I would n- actually not encourage... Connor, who's Nita's husband, uh, to become a Let's Player as a career, or like to be aiming for that. If that happens, that's amazing. And if he wants to do a Let's Play channel, that's great. I mean, do anything you want to do digitally. It's like, it's free to do, it's fun, do it with your friends, whatever. If you think about it as a professional thing, great. But if you're like convinced that that's going to become a career, that is a very, very uphill battle. And I just think you should be aware going in that it's it's really challenging. So what I would honestly do is say, start doing that, have a great time with it, but find something else to do that is going to make you money if you need to be making money. Yeah. I mean, I think we said this a couple of episodes ago, but the side hustle thing, I think probably speaking for the both of us here, we're like... We kind of had side hustles that unexpectedly turned into the primary hustle for something like a Let's Play channel, which, you know, I don't know a whole lot about other than just having watched them for years is like, it takes time and same with being a Twitch streamer. Like, oh yeah, a lot of the people that you see now who have huge followings, like they're very on their face. Like, yeah, I've been streaming for eight years for like seven of those. Nobody was watching me and I was just doing it because I liked it. And now it finally worked. I don't know. I have a couple of irons in the fire and do a thing because you want to do it and you enjoy doing it, but not necessarily like you don't go both feet in first, I guess, on a Let's Play channel of like, I'm throwing everything else away. Let's go. Let's do it. Follow that passion, but also remember that you got to eat. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, there's some things, as we've probably said explicitly on this channel, like if you have to do it, if you have to be an artist, if you have to be a musician, you got to do it. Go do it. You know, Uh, understand that it might or might not work out, but If that is the thing you have to be doing, that's what you have to be doing. Yeah, and you'll find your way to it. Also, Connor, you're 22. Like, buddy, you got time. I know that was part of the email of, you know, Nina's like, okay, you have time, but also everyone's putting this pressure on. But it's like, 
your baby. I'm with you. We're both baby. Like you got time to figure it out. You have plenty of time to do this. You have plenty of time to do let's play, like whatever you want to do. Yeah. You have so much time in front of you. And if people are giving you shit about it and they're not the ones paying your rent or like making sure that you have food, like they can kind of fuck off. Like it's not really any of their business. Totally. Remember, my full-time music career started when I was 40. And even that wasn't full-time yet because I was still running socials for Grumps for a couple of years. Like I've only been doing music as a full-time thing for the past, whatever, two years, something like that. Mm -hmm. So basically when I was, I don't know, 43, 42, something like that, that's 20 years older than you are (laughs) and no regrets at all on my end, but it took a long time to, to find that because I was doing something else for a while. I had a different career. Don't be afraid to explore different artistic things, but I would be very careful about, I, I, the reason I say this, I got this advice about something that sounds totally different probably, but is kind of the same, which was grad school. I was told when I was thinking about going to grad school for physics, you know, don't think of it as a means to an end. Think of it as an end in itself. Like just because you go to grad school doesn't mean that you're going to graduate. And if you do graduate, that degree doesn't mean you'll get a postdoc, a research position. And if you get a first postdoc, it doesn't mean you're going to get a second. And if you get a second, it doesn't mean you get a faculty, et cetera. Like, so you kind of have to be happy with what you have to practice acceptance at each step. You can have goals in mind and you should, and you should shoot for them and, you know, go all out and reach for the stars. But I think it is important to be realistic about what the probabilities are that you'll succeed. The whole time I was doing physics, I was always assuming that I would not eventually succeed. I was trying to, but I went in with like a, if this works great, if it doesn't, it doesn't. And it did work out for me, but I was definitely a rare case. Most of my friends did not get faculty jobs. Uh, And I I think that was a good attitude for me personally to have. Yeah, that sounds like solid advice. And and it's again, like, you know, thinking about why you want to do this thing. Let's say it's Let's Play, Let's Play it. Say it's art or music or whatever. Like understanding that if you were, you know, in your mind's eye having this image of like, oh, I will acquire X status or whatever, then I will feel Y thing, i.e. happiness. If you do that, you are going to move the goalposts on yourself forever. Forever. And feel miserable. Yep. I think it's important to have goals and set goals. But if you fixate on, well, if I just win an Emmy for writing a TV show, I will be happy. I mean, maybe you'll win an Emmy for writing a TV show, uh, but it's not going to be like, aha, yes, I am happy now. Because that is not how it has ever worked for anyone ever, unfortunately. Nope. I'll use my own self as an example. I've achieved, I think, like every career dream I've ever had. Mm-hmm. That sounds like the, literally the douchiest thing to say. But like we, you know, we played an arena show last year, and I don't feel like I've made it. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. I'm happy with what we did, but it does not feel like you know, swish. Now kick back and relax, and that's that's the career. Like, no, you you always got to keep trying, unless you have some crazy windfall where you make you know millions of dollars for doing whatever. You know, mm-hmm. you invent fucking Minecraft or something. Uh, and you just become a flaming racist on Twitter. Yeah, and then you turn into an absolute monster. <laughs> but the thing is that we, I, I totally agree with what you said, Leighton. It's never enough. And at least for almost everybody I know, you get to that big milestone. You know, you put out the game that's a huge hit or whatever. <laughs> and then the next day you're like, all right, so what now? And that is the rest of your life. Yeah. And you're like, well, this one thing that I obsessively fixated on for years and years and years in my mind's eye of a thing I never thought I would have. And now suddenly I have it and it is in my lap. What the fuck is wrong with me that I feel numb? Like, is it just like this forever? Is it going to be like this with everything that I ever thought would make me happy? And then you have an existential crisis and protracted mental breakdown. I'm not speaking from experience. (laughs) Um, But it also like, I was watching this, um, a little bit of this talk of, it was um, Philip Seymour Hoffman talking with a philosopher for like an hour about like what happiness means, Mm -hmm. which was really fascinating and also terribly sad. (laughs) Philip Seymour Hoffman might be up there with Taco Bell and- Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fair. Whatever other awful shit I mention on the show constantly. But he has a really good quote from it that I'm going to misquote. So Philip Seymour Hoffman is talking about like 
what he thinks happiness is. And he gets into this very like profound thing about how he doesn't think that he's ever had it or if he'll find it. But when he's with his three children and not only gets to be with them, but gets to see them enjoying each other and enjoying him, that's probably the closest he gets. And then he went on to say, like, they kind of got into this like hedonism thing of like, so is happiness actually pleasure? And then the quote is, quote, I would definitely not say pleasure is happiness. I think I kill pleasure. Like I take too much of it and therefore make it unpleasurable. There is no pleasure I haven't actually made myself sick on. And I've been thinking about that quote all week. I mean, partially because of how he died. Rest in peace, sir. Um, But yeah, it was like very profound to me. Yeah, that's a good quote. All I can say to that is... Is that what you wanted, Leighton? Is that the kind of soundboard antics you were looking for earlier? So tasteful. <laughs> uh, you found happiness. <laughs> oh, it's gone. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> there it is again. <laughs> there it is again. Oh, you thought you have it? Oh, there it goes. Goodbye. Yeah, baby. Speaking of which, another thing I mentioned on the show all the time, Todd Salon's 1998 happiness. Mm-hmm. One of those ones that I'm just trying to harass everyone into watching, even though it's a horrible movie um, that just makes you uncomfortable. But I was just thinking about John Lovitz, you know? Uh, he's in that first scene that's oh, just the best. so excellent. I am champagne. You are shit. <laughs> John Lovitz is great. I was talking to Jory about this of like, why didn't he have like crazy, maybe like Stephen Toblowski level, like ubiquitous character actorness to him aside from like a few of the things that he's known for? He's fucking awesome. He is awesome, although he does kind of, I mean, much more so, I mean, than Tobolowski, always play the same character. Of course. Which is very funny and awesome. But, you know, he's always this guy. He's kind yeah. of always talking like that. And it's very funny. <laughs> but, I mean, that's not quite a John Lovitz impression, but that's the cadence. Yeah, but could Stephen Tobolowski kick the shit out of Andy Dick? No. <laughs> oh, we all have that dream. <laughs> to beat Andy Dick's ass. Uh, <laughs> oh, poor troubled Andy Dick. No, uh, not poor troubled Andy Dick. Fuck that guy. Well, what did he do? Uh, <laughs> has he done bad stuff? I legitimately don't know. I just know him as a <laughs> guy with you, a drug problem. Why are you doing a bit? <laughs> I'm not. I'm legitimately not doing a bit. <laughs> oh, God. What has Andy Dick done that's so awful? <laughs> Hold on. I'm going to send you his Wikipedia page. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, no. <laughs> So fucking bad. <laughs> like half of the entire page is just his various actual crimes. Um, but the reason John Lovitz beat the shit out of him is because he was the one who um, gave, I can't remember if it was coke or heroin to Phil Hartman's wife a couple of months before she murdered Phil Hartman. And Phil Hartman was like a brother to him. And so, yeah. Okay. Question in the suicide of an actor. Uh, there was a drug thing, indecent exposure of buttocks at a local McDonald's, uh, more drug. Okay. Now he sexually harassed an underage girl. Yep. That's awful. I mean, like when you have to have an entire section on your Wikipedia page called legal issues and controversies with multiple subheadings, including one that's just a link to the page for the me too movement on Wikipedia. Um, probably not doing great. I take everything I said back. This is, oh, and there's racist stuff. Okay, this is. He was forcibly removed from the stage on, a, on Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, it really just does keep going. There's a section on feud with John Lovitz. Okay. There you go. Well, yeah. I think we have to keep in that I said poor troubled Andy Dick there, but uh, <laughs> I completely retract that. I knew absolutely none of this, and I do not support Andy Dick's actions. Let me be very clear <laughs> about that. Well, see, Brian, this is great, though, because this is a learning moment. You didn't know this. You said the thing. I've educated you while laughing at you the entire time. <laughs> and I just love that basically the end of this Wikipedia article is, Lovitz then smashed Dick's head into the bar, which is a fabulous sentence. Anyway, fuck Andy Dick. We love John Lovitz. Love and protect John Lovitz. This yeah, one's for wow. you, bud. This is bad. Oh, wow. This is right, really right? bad. See, I didn't know the full extent of it either. The reason I was going down this PSH in John Lovitz hole was like I woke up one morning and I was like, didn't John Lovitz beat the shit out of Andy Dick? <laughs> wow. I was like, well, I got to do my little deep dive here. Then there's anti-Semitic stuff. Oh, my God. He was thrown out of the AVN Awards. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, 
God. This, yeah, this is, this is bad. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm not going to dwell on this <laughs> any further. <laughs> Sounds like you're dwelling on it. I'm just fascinated. I mean, I'm not like, you know, Dr. Celebrity Gossip or anything, but that's the episode title, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I'm at least generally aware of, you know, celebrities of my era, what they're up to, I guess. The ones who are doing uh, some hate crimes, you know, you got to keep up. <laughs> well, okay. Here's, here's my point. I don't know what 20 year old celebrities or like teen celebrities are doing right now, nor did I when I was a teenager for that matter, but whatever. But someone who like Andy Dick, who is roughly 10 years older than I am, but is someone I was aware of and had seen. That's a guy that was in my like pop culture wheelhouse mm -hmm. that I would think I knew something about, but I guess I did not. I think the drug stuff, I guess I knew about. Wow, we were spending way too much time on this. <laughs> on Andy Dick? I don't know. Yeah. I See, I feel like normally we would just be like, I don't know, let's cut this out. But I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by it. Like, Oh, we're not cutting this out, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of how this stuff goes. And I think we kind of like start to touch a touchy thing and then we're like, oh, it's a comedy podcast. We got to cut it out. And like, I don't know. I think this is interesting. It, and I mean, that's the kind of thing where you look at this stuff and you look at the dates of like when all this shit happened and it's just such a like strong indicator of like, yeah, people kind of don't give a shit if you do a bunch of bad shit because they just keep, I mean, look at his fucking filmography. He keeps working. Yeah. Well, because he was, you know, he, um, he was funny, right? He was a funny actor. So I'm sure people were willing to put up with all this bullshit because they're like, that guy's funny, which they definitely should not have. And also people like you just had no idea. Like sometimes you just don't know. There's so much shit happening that you don't see it. And I think there's also like that sort of thing of like, oh, I didn't know that stuff, but I did know about like drug addiction where it's like yeah. almost like all this other shit gets sweeped under the umbrella of drug addiction. I bet that's what happened. Although I certainly did not know any of the sexual assault stuff, which is, there is a lot of here. Yeah. Ugh, real oh, bad. He was born in Charleston, South Carolina. Great. Well, he was in Queer Duck, the movie. I believe that's based on a uh, a Flash animation that I used to like in the early 2000s. Anyway, hope you all enjoyed the Andy Dick chat. Um, <laughs> sound off in the comments if you want to cancel us for talking about Andy Dick and how he sucks. Every time I get on Chrome and it's like, Flash is no longer going to be supported oh. after December 2019. And I'm like, what the fuck is, you're the man now, dog. Just somebody archived all of that, right? I hope so. There were so many great Flash animations in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. like late 90s, early 2000s, that I feel like they started, lasted for a couple of years. Some of them got bought by people, of course, and now they're all gone. The big one to me is Radiskull. Do you know Radiskull? No. See, okay. This is, you, you were just a, a tiny baby when Radiskull ruled the earth. Oh, this looks sick as fuck. Radiskull was my favorite thing for a couple of years. And the guy, I think his name was Joe Sparks, would put out episodes only occasionally like he did them until they were done and put them out and i thought this was just the greatest thing radiskull and devil doll you know radiskull is like this punk ass skull and he has this little devil doll sidekick who just loves to stab and murder i don't see how this possibly could have been a creative influence on you in any capacity <laughs> they do little songs oh i loved radiskull so much uh, i'm sure you can find all these on youtube oh yeah i see them at least those are like backed up I'm just like, I really hope that there is actually like a movement. I mean, I guess the Wayback Machine and Internet Archive are really great about saving those things. Because by the way, folks, if you don't know, a little thing called GIF Cities. Uh, it's an archive of every single GIF used on GeoCities. And so you can look shit up, you find a bunch of GIFs, and not only do you get to see all the dope GIFs, you can click on them and see where they were used in context on the preserved archive of the webpage. It is hours of entertainment. Oh my God. Icebox. Like you just go into Gift Cities, type in skeleton, like just roll with it. It's great. Th that's right. There was a site Icebox, which had a lot of stuff that I used to watch. Wow. Zombie College. Oh my God. I have not thought about Zombie College in 15 years. Fuck. Wow. Oh, that's definitely a flash art style. This is ex zombie. I used to love Zombie College. Oh my God. I totally forgot about it. And there were only 12 episodes. Wow. This is great. And Billy West did voices. How did I? And John DiMaggio. What? How did I not know this? How did I not know about that voice talent? Fuck. Wow. Oh, I'm so excited about this.
Yeah, now I'm trying to think of what the Flash stuff I liked other than like far-flung random things that I found. Homestar Runner? No, I missed Homestar Runner, which I know is pretty tragic. Yeah, well, there's there's only one trog door. <laughs> I was really big into uh, Gotham Girls, which was... Don't know it. It's exactly what it sounds like. It was just like a three season, like flash sort of interactive thing. Wow. It ran from 2000 to 2002, but it was just about Harley Quinn, Boys and Ivy and Batgirl. And it was like Tara Strong did literally every single voice in the fucking thing. Mm, and cool. rewatching some of the ones that are on like YouTube and stuff. Wow. They're very basic, but it was very formative for me in terms of sense of humor and also being attracted to women. So it's a good one. Go check it out. Gotham Girls. None of them are interactive anymore, unfortunately, because mm. uh, they used to be like little fun flash games that you could play along with watching them. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it was really cute. How did you miss Homestar Runner? I guess you would have been just a baby when that was... I was really young, yeah. Oh, Homestar Runner is the best. I mean, Strong Bad was a very, very influential thing for me as well, for sure. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I, I see the like trickles down of it. But yeah, I was never deep in it. But I mean, like, you know, you spec out in different directions in terms of I know way too much about Homestuck still, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And yep. so here we are today, uh, being a massive creative influence on my body of work. Although what's interesting to me is the, the stuff that I'm talking about for me was when I was, let's see, about your age, a little older, maybe when that really hit, mm. like early 2000s, I was born in 75. So I would have been 25 in 2000. So I, I was right around where you are in terms of age. And, and these were still huge, huge influences. Also, I'm convinced that I haven't watched these in many years, but I, I think probably a lot of these were doing like edgy stuff in a very uncool way. Yeah. And I would be very curious if any of these held up as all right now. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I was talking to Jory about Andy Dick. Now I'm just rehashing the conversation that I had with Jory with you because he is a good go-to for me to be like, hey, you ever see this obscure media thing uh, like Andy Dick? <laughs> uh, and then, you know, he'll he'll humor me. But did you ever watch uh, Frisky Dingo? I never did. I know a lot of people who did, and I just never, never saw it. I've probably seen an episode here and there. I know it's hugely popular, though. Really? Because I never see anybody talk about it. Really? I feel like I know tons of people who... Love it. Yeah, I haven't watched it since I was in early high school. And I remember it like cracking me the fuck up. And I don't remember anything about it. And I feel like maybe, maybe it doesn't hold up. I'm not positive. The thing that I remember the most about it getting me is anything that commits to having just like extended periods of silence is a bit, mm -hmm. is a win in my book, which is like, I think what the series opens on of just like a very extended, uncomfortable silence. <laughs> That's great. Anyway, folks, if you like Frisky Dingo, uh, smash that motherfucking like and then don't comment. I'll, I'll take all likes to mean that you're a really huge uh, Frisky Dingo head. Or Andy Dick fan. <laughs> this is a terrible running bit for this episode. So again, right around the same time as I was watching this stuff was when maybe a little earlier, all the first Adult Swim stuff was coming out. Mm -hmm. Space Ghost was college for me and then Aqua Teen was shortly thereafter. And that stuff also hugely influential. I quoted Aqua Teen in my PhD thesis as like the, the plate. I have two quotes. One is from Chaucer. The other is the Moon Knights from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. <laughs> and the Moon Knights one was relevant to what I was doing. Please elaborate. And I want to know what the Chaucer quote was also. Basically the Moon Knights one was, it's from the first Moon Knights episode and Ignacnacht who's the larger one, says something like, you and your three dimensions. And I forget who, Frylock or whatever, says, well, how many do you have? And he goes, five. And then Ur, his little companion, goes, thousand. And so it's, yeah, we have 5,000. And someone says, well, I only see two. And then Ignictoc says, well, that sounds like a personal problem. <laughs> and this was very relevant to string theory. Because string theory posits the existence of six extra, sometimes more, six extra spatial dimensions, which you just can't see. And to me, that, well, we have 5,000 dimensions. I only see two. Well, that's your problem. Was very much how I thought about 
like, you know, I, I was kind of agnostic on whether this was, are these real dimensions or not? Are, we, are there actually extra dimensions? That's still an interesting question. Maybe the answer is yes. Maybe the answer is no. No evidence for it, but certainly possible. But certainly people who just dismissed string theory out of hand because it had six extra spatial dimensions without understanding the ways of getting around that and turning that into a, a feature, not a bug, that to me was a personal problem. So this quote from the Moonanites about, well, you can't see this extra stuff, like these literal extra dimensions that are all around us. In their case, they're, they're obviously lying. But the fact that you can't see it, that's your problem. That's kind of how I felt about people who were extremely negative about string theory. It was like, you don't see why this is interesting? That's your problem. Have your views on string theory changed since then? I'm assuming how long ago was that? Well, I graduated... Uh, from grad school in 2004, so 16 years. There have been lots of developments, but my essential view that it seems interesting and worth studying is has not changed. I don't know what generation string theorists you would call me. Sort of the big heyday of first wave string theory was in like the early 80s. But there were people who in the early days were like, what I'm saying is, is kind of wrong. But in the early days, we're like, this is it. We solved it. We got everything. <laughs> 10 dimensions. Boom. We're going to calculate first principles, masses of all the particles, fundamental particles. Like, no problem. We got it. All right. You know, send my Nobel Prize over here. And that 100% did not work out. And by the time I came around and really started working on string theory, uh, I viewed it as a tool to solve interesting problems more than a this is the way the universe works kind of thing. Mm. And my view of it as a tool to solve interesting problems has not changed at all. It's still a great tool and very, very useful for lots of cool stuff. Is it correct? Well, I don't fucking know. Like, maybe. But in many ways, there's sort of less evidence for that, for it being correct uh, in a sense than there was before. The LHC didn't find this thing called supersymmetry, which a lot of people thought it would. And... If there was string theory, there has to be supersymmetry. So if the LHC had found these extra particles, that would have been, in some sense, there's all sorts of asterisks here. It would have been not direct evidence for string theory. It would have made string theory more plausible, in a sense. It's not like you find supersymmetry, string theory has to be right. You can have supersymmetry without string theory. But certainly that they didn't find it, a lot of people were like, well, that's probably wrong. And also, probably string theory is wrong, too. Hmm. So there's, in in a way, less evidence for it than there used to be when I was in grad school. But the stuff I was using string theory for anyway, which was like, let's look at interesting stuff, still interesting. Yeah, so my, my question was going to be like, if you're using it to look at other interesting stuff, what is that other interesting stuff that you're using it for? Uh, it varies. The general idea that came out in the late 90s is this idea of duality. I mean, there are many different dualities, but basically it's, hey, I have this really hard problem here. Hey, if I look at it in a different language, it makes it a really easy problem. And if I solve the easy problem, I get the solution to the hard problem. And there are all sorts of examples of this in, in physics over the years. But in string theory, this guy, Juan Malvasena, who was a professor where I was a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, discovered that a string theory in 10 dimensions is dual to a quantum field theory, basically, in four dimensions, which is the kind of theory that describes the particles in the universe. And these theories are hard to solve, typically. So I'm being very glib here. But basically, the idea was that if you want to solve problems that maybe are more realistic, there is possibly a string theory description which makes those hard problems much easier. And similarly, there are some things you can calculate in the more realistic theories where those theories are easy, but the string theory would be hard. So this idea of duality of, oh, it's hard in this language, but easy in this language, and I can show or plausibly indicate that those theories are equivalent was a big, big deal and something that I spent a lot of time thinking about, both from the more realistic, what you call field theory perspective and the more geometrical string theory perspective. So this idea is called ADS-CFT for reasons I'm absolutely not going to get into right now. <laughs> it's like one of the big revolutions in theoretical physics and has become, you know, just part of the language that many theoretical physicists, including me, speak. That's fascinating. So I'm curious about, like, uh, when you talk about string theory and sort of this, I'm probably not going to use the right nomenclature here, but, like, it parallel universes, dimensions? How do, how, how do you refer to, like, these... Extra dimensions? Is that what you mean? Yeah. 
what are the ramifications of there being extra dimensions? Like in terms of like, do laws of physics change between the dimensions in a theory sense? Or like, I don't know, I guess the way that my brain goes to it is like, does it intersect with like an ontological kind of thing of like, oh, because that's a thing that's always interested me, which I don't think is necessarily relevant to string theory, but just like sort of alternate uh, kind of sandwich together realities or whatever. No, it has nothing to do with Sick. that. So you're thinking of like parallel universes. Yeah. I'm talking about extra spatial dimensions. Okay, fuck like yeah, get into it. A dimension that is perpendicular to the ones we see. Okay. Totally different. So elaborate on that. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it's just that. So they're, they're theoretically, hypothetically, you know, we live in a universe of four dimensions, three space and one time. And it is a logical possibility that there are other directions out there perpendicular to ours. Just like, you know, if you have a, a plane, a two-dimensional surface, you can think of a dimension that's perpendicular, which is up, mm -hmm. is the third dimension. Maybe there's some other dimension that's perpendicular to those three, and so on and so forth. and why Why not? We, we don't see them. There's no direct evidence for them, but it is possible we're stuck in some subspace of a much larger space. And that's an experimental question, kind of. Mm -hmm. And now there's no evidence for this, but there was a lab in Seattle that was doing this experiment. So gravity is a warping of uh, space-time by mass. So if there are extra dimensions, you could imagine the forces of our universe, like uh, electricity and magnetism, are stuck to our subspace, but gravity can't be, basically. If there's mass, energy, it warps all the space-time around it. So, And similarly, the more dimensions you're in, the weaker gravity gets. In our universe, our three spatial dimensions universe, gravity is an inverse square law. If you double the distance between two things, the force of gravity is a quarter weaker between them. It goes by one over the distance squared. So if you're in four spatial dimensions, instead of being one over distance squared, it's one over distance cubed. Okay. And that's basically because the gravitational kind of flux lines have more room to spread out. So you can ask if you have extra dimensions that are really, really small, which is, I didn't get into this, but this is one of the ways that you can get rid of these extra dimensions that you can explain away the fact that we don't see them is to say, actually, they're just real tiny. <laughs> is you can ask, if you put things super close together, does the force of gravity lessen and start behaving like one over R cubed, one over R to the fourth, whatever? And that's an experimental question. And there are people who did that experiment to know positive evidence. Of course, if, if people found extra dimensions, you would know about it. Of course. But the point is, it is kind of an experimental question. That is really interesting. I won't claim to understand everything of what you just said, but it's really cool. We don't really get into this stuff much on this podcast, which I always forget because we're doing comedy bits. Well, I have a rule. I can't talk about physics until I've talked about Andy Dick. <laughs> I think the most important part of you know the Andy Dick story is John Lovett smashing his head into a bar, which, as we all know, is only possible because of gravity. Yeah, <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> yeah, we don't talk about physics that much, in part because I don't think this is a great forum for it because I can't write anything mm. but also because it's not what we do so i love talking about it it's great it's very hard to explain this stuff just in an audio medium for sure we've been lax on 15 dollars tier stuff this month although i will say that we have a cool thing planned several cool things planned question mark but you should do you should explain a physics thing yeah i, 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 have, a, I have a couple ideas called explain a physics thing explain a physics thing i was going to talk about dimensions actually a little bit yeah, please. and I have an idea uh, for, for the $15 people. Custom dimensions. Custom dimensions for you, yes. It, one, one thing I think is interesting that I might make a video on is fractional dimensions, fractals. And there's a very intuitive argument you can give for why certain things are not one or two or three dimensions, but instead like log two over log three dimensions, you know, or whatever, like some weird fractional irrational number. So I was thinking about making a little video about that. Yeah. That sounds fun. I'll, I'll see it when you make it and not understand much more than I do now, but you're good at explaining. Are you familiar with, with fractional dimensions? Is that a concept that's familiar to you? I mean, I know fractals like visually and basic number wise, but not really in terms of dimensions. I mean, that, that yeah, that, that's a fractal is a fractional dimensional set. So basically it's something like, you know, they say the coastlines are often fractals 
right? Because if you trace them out, like they have, they're not just lines Mm -hmm. because they're all wiggly uh, and kind of densely packed. They look like dimension uh, more than one, for example. So I'm not going to get into it, but I might make a video (laughs) about it. All right. Should we move on to what's popping? Yeah, we should move on to what's. Hey, do you want to hear the theme song? What's poppin'? Only in fucking private, never in mixed company. God damn it. Solid theme song, right? Yeah, that's fine. Ryan, what's poppin'? What's poppin' for me is it's an HBO show from, I think, last year that I sat on for a while. It's Los Spookies. Yeah, you've mentioned it. That's the Fred Armisen show, right? It's Fred Armisen, uh, created by Julio Torres, Ana Fabrega. And it is so fucking great. Oh, my God. (laughs) I think a couple weeks ago, we were like, if Tim Burton had stayed weird, he'd be the greatest thing ever. Mm -hmm. But instead, he went all like corporate. This is what that is. This is like the weird shit you wish Tim Burton had kept doing. All right. But set in some fictional Latin American country. It's mainly a Spanish language show. It's got a really, really great cast, notably, especially Julio Torres and Ana Fabrega. And they're all a bunch of weirdos who put on spooky little events. It's just awesome. Every episode has a bunch of just like bonkers dialogue that makes no sense, but in a really, really funny way. Uh, I can't recommend it highly enough. It does have Fred Armisen in it, who's very funny. Occasional other guest stars show up. And occasionally there's a little bit of English here and there, but mostly it's, it's Spanish. I I love everything about it. The production design, the acting, the writing, it's just wonderful. So I highly, highly recommend it. Wow. That's lovely. And you said it's HBO? It's HBO. I think there's six episodes in the first season and I think they're picked up for a second, but I don't know when that's coming out. Awesome. Yep. All right. Layton, what's popping? All right. What's popping for me is that I have to literally, I'm going through my YouTube watch history, which is pretty damning combination of things. Uh, it's like Philip Seymour Hoffman, Philip Seymour Hoffman, a bunch of uh, home home movies, Coach McGurk clips. Uh, we got some ASMR, a lot of okay. ASMR. Good, good, good. But the thing that I'm going to share is a 51 second video that's just stupid. Um, I'm going to drop it in the chat and I need you to watch it along with me. Yep, there it is. Sorry, first of all, this video is called LDS Missionary Sends It. All right, he's on his bike. How's it going? As you can see here, we got a lot of land. And a lot of land means a lot of jumps. Well, look at that sucker right, right there. About to do a big jump. I'm going to clear it. You're silly if you think I'm not going to send it. And now he's riding his bike back. <laughs> and there he goes. <laughs> oh, that poor guy. You okay, guys? <laughs> wow, that is excellent comedy. Yeah, right? It's a classic. You know, you got man man versus nature. Man versus tiny. Oh, that poor tiny. guy, though. <laughs> You're silly if you, th- if you think I'm not going to send it. That's the best part. Yeah, absolutely. Vernon sent that to me, and I rewatched it like four times in a row last night just because the beats of it, the timing, it's like perfect. It's the timing. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Like there are things like that, you know, there's funny videos on the internet, but it really is a practice. So for a thing that I guess people will see a day after this episode comes out, Brian and I participated in one of the Real Good Touring shows, uh, Bright Spot, by making stupid TikToks, um, and that's all I'll say. But in doing research of how to do TikTok dances. Let's say you wanted to see either Brian or I do some famous TikTok dances. You should real nasty ones too. Yeah. Some, some very like wet ones, if you know what I'm oh, saying. Yeah. Anyway, so that's Saturday bright spot. Check it out. But I was doing research on like TikToks cause I was like, I've never really dove into this. And I was looking at the subreddit TikTok cringe, which I hate anything that's like <laughs> under the umbrella of cringe because it's just so inherently mean spirited. And the whole point of that sub, it's like a, um, you know, people who like weed is r slash trees. And then for people who are into botany, it's r slash marijuana enthusiasts. I was not familiar with that, no. So there are a lot of really cute things like that. And it's very funny with r slash trees because every once in a while, someone will wander into r slash trees and be like, what picture is this? And then all the stoners play along and they're like, yeah, I think this is, uh, this might be a begonia maybe. I don't know. (laughs) 
Anyway, so TikTok cringe is actually like the misleading name for like, here's all the good TikToks sub. And so I was watching a ton of them and it's so much of it like, so with Vine, you have seven seconds. With TikTok, I think you have up to 60, if not more. 60? Six zero? Yeah, 60 seconds. But it's really interesting what kind of like the time limitation of like Vine forces you to go with the comedy. Because like a lot of the TikToks I was watching, I was like, okay, these people have too much time. They have a really good bit. They hit the punchline and then they just kept going with it. And maybe this is just a thing that I recognize because I'm yeah. very, very guilty of going way too long on bits that should have ended like five minutes ago. Uh I know nothing about that, of course. <laughs> Don't know what you're talking about. It's yeah, fascinating baby. how much of comedy is timing. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so my, my what's popping for me is LDS Missionary sends it. <laughs> 51 seconds of comedy gold. Great. All right. Do you want to do this other segment that I also didn't think about? Yes. Oh, it's weird to actually hear the songs as we're recording. I think this is the first time we've actually done it. Yeah. I would never do this with a guest, of course. It would of be course, too in mixed polite. company, it would be inappropriate. Um, Sometimes I forget how off-putting the very deep voice in Peaches and Lemons is, and I really like it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's your entire thing. Anyone who's listened to an hour and a half of this episode in particular, I'm going to guess already knows what Peaches and Lemons is. And God help you if you wandered in and you don't know what Peaches and Lemons is. It's a gratitude exercise. The peach is a nice thing that happened or that might happen or that you feel good about. Uh, they wouldn't stop talking about Andy's dick, so I had to cut out like 20 more minutes of it. Here's Layton's Peaches. My first peach is I started making resin crafts. I got some of my molds in, getting high on resin fumes, which you should absolutely not do and is probably causing me permanent lung damage. I'm wearing PPE. It's fine. I'm doing a bit. Um, I care for my lung health unless it uh, comes to marijuana. Can, can I ask you a question? Is it resin or rosin? I always thought it was rosin. Well, rosin is like for a bow. Yeah, exactly. Is that different than resin? Yeah. Yeah, like epoxy resin. Oh, okay. Or like resin, cool weed resin, which is what my mother said when I called her and I was on my balcony and I was like, yeah, yeah, blah, 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 I'm making crafts. Then I stepped inside and I was like, oh, damn, it smells like resin in here. And she was like, how much weed are you smoking? Um, <laughs> can, can I tell you something that indicates what a tender young soul I am? Please. I don't know what weed resin is. I legitimately have no idea. That's fair. I'm kind of shocked that my mother did. It's basically like the THC concentrate. Uh, so when people do dabs, uh, which is you get resin or like wax. I'm actually probably butchering this a little bit. Is it the same as hash? Is, is resin the same as hash? Different kind of. Basically, they all get your really fucking sicky, icky, nar nar uh, blazed, fucked in the head. Resin is like... Radical. Yeah, it's like wax or like crumble or whatever. Oh, it sounds whack. Yeah, you superheat it and then it vaporizes the THC instantly and then you sit with an um, entire pan of cobbler that you made in the middle of the day and you watch every single paranormal activity movie that has come out and then you don't remember any of them, but you have eaten that entire cobbler, not speaking from experience. Anyway, resin, not rosin like the bow or rosin like the candy, which is very good, but I can't eat anymore because I have fillings okay. um, or crowns, question mark, teeth stuff. I don't know. It's 9.30 on a Tuesday. Anyway, I started making resin crafts, and that's peach number one. I've been fucking it up a lot, but it is very satisfying to make a tangible art piece that you can hold in your hands, and also you can put a lot of glitter in it. So that sparks joy. Great. Peach number two is, I guess by the time this comes out, this will be fully announced. Um, I'm a part of a very cool, like, women focused like the whole crew and like all the talent is ladies a halloween show that's going to be streaming on halloween called the witching hour that it's hosted by our good friend Susie, who i don't know may or may not be on this podcast in the coming weeks <gasps> spoiler um what but yeah the the show should be really fun i don't want to say too much about it but i designed all of the merch that you can now purchase. I made a promotional interactive fiction thing that went up on Wednesday that was pretty much solely for the purpose of hawking merch, but I put a lot of effort into it and it has stupid jokes in it. So if you like the things that I make, you might enjoy playing that. 
anyway, really excited about my segment on the show. We're filming some pre-taped stuff this weekend. And uh, yeah, just like nice to be a part of a thing that is fun and spooky. So that's, I guess that's where I've been channeling my October feelings. Hashtag October feelings. Cool. Peach number three. I went on two walks today with my dog. So take that. Peach number three. <laughs> It's nothing quite as sweet as a low effort last minute peach. Low effort last minute peach, maybe that's that's all I got. I mean, it, at least it's me doing this honestly now, struggling to come up with it rather than right before we record, where it's like I'm going to forget this in an hour and sound like a dipshit in front of the guest. Yeah, like people come on and I'm like, you can do it as like vague or you know as petty or like profound. And I was like, I love my wife. I really love my wife. Number two, I love my brother. <laughs> <laughs> I think those are the best. Is one of us is like. Uh, you know, so I, I, I put a piece of pepperoni in the microwave and it exploded and it was the most delicious thing I ever ate. And then someone's like, my brother just got out of the hospital and I deeply love him. It's the, my favorite juxtaposition. Like I like to clicky on my keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, that's, what's fun about this show. I, I mean that very genuinely, especially the juxtaposition between last episode and this one, where we make a running bit about Andy Dick being a sexual predator. It's not, it's not a bit. I'm it's not, a fact. I'm not laughing. It's a, tr- it's, a it's a true fact. It's just, you know, we're raising awareness. Like, hey, there are shitty people. Yes, not okay. As if you didn't already know that there are shitty people. Oh, this is yeah. great. This is going super good. Jarek, good luck with this one. Yeah, have fun, Jarek. Uh... Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Peaches. Give me peaches. All right. Uh, peach number one. I have a new album out today. If you're listening to this the day it comes out. Oh, shit. Congratulations. Yep. That's the album The Prophecy by my little old band, Ninja Sex Party. And I love the album, and I hope you guys do too. So please, it's a plug, but it's also something I'm legitimately happy about because we didn't know if we were going to be able to get it out uh, this year, and we did. So if you're hearing this on Friday, October 16th, a brand new NSP comedy album waiting for you. What's your favorite track? Do Math With You is a is a slow jam about math that, it was a rare one for me because I wrote the basically the hook and stuff just on my own. And I brought it to Dan and our producer, Jim, when we had a writing session. And I was like, here's my idea for this song. Here's how it goes. I think it's called Do Math With You. And w- this almost never happens. They were both like, yes, great, let's do it. And you know, normally ideas take a little. And of course, we developed it and changed some stuff and blah, blah, blah uh, from there. But it's very rare for, and not, not just me, an idea anyone brings in to be like, yes, that, let's do that without significant alteration. Mm-hmm. You know, it's nice when you bring an idea and your collaborator's like, yep, love it, moving on. <laughs> yeah, it is a very good feeling. Yep, and I play saxophone on it too hey. uh, to bring this podcast full circle. Man, us starting this episode like sax feels like a million years ago. I know, right? Uh, peach number two is my very dear friend and manager, Brent Lilly, who I asked to be on the podcast this week, but would not do what it. The fuck, Brent? Uh, yep. Uh, he said he feels like he's not good on podcasts. Oh, t- uh, hold on. I'm angrily texting him right now. No, 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 wait until afterwards. You can really get into it. Um, but I respect his decision. Like, you know, I, I, I had a guy. Killer idea for a bit called That's Brentertainment. I've mentioned this before, an insider's guide to Hollywood, but nope. This is literally going to be the flagship bit of this show. I remember one of the first bits that we talked about. That's Brentertainment was one of the first ones. Yep, I know. So, Brent, as you walk home, listening to your little podcast with your cigar, we love you. We're mad at you for not valuing your time. Wait. No, if you valued your time, you wouldn't be on the show. So he's making the right decision. But come bullshit with us is what I'm saying. Oh, he literally just texted me right as I started talking about him about what a nice time he had last night, too. God damn uh, bastard. But, okay. So that, that was great by itself. But the real peach here is that he brought his dog Lincoln over. Oh, sweet Lincoln. And for the first time in ever, Coco started playing like actually playing with another dog. And I've never seen this dog move so quickly. No way. Yep. So Coco had a great time, but that's not even the peach. The real peach is that Audrey could not remember the dog's name and kept calling it Layton. <laughs> and she'd be like, Layton, put down that ball. Layton, come here. Layton, get off Coco. And 
it was a true joy to have every 30 seconds be like, no, Audrey, Layton's the person you, you, you did crafts with. Lincoln is the dog. And she'd be like, okay, Lincoln. Layton, come here. <laughs> The thing is, is this oh. is not the first time that I've been repeatedly confused for a dog by a small child. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's two L names that begin and end in the same sound. I can get it. It's like you hear the L, you space out, and then suddenly there's an N. In the cul-de-sac at my dad's house, we had a lovely uh, couple of neighbors who were little girls. But, you know, my dad's name is Nathan. At the time, my childhood dog's name was Quentin. And so the the triumvirate of Leighton, Nathan, Quentin was very confusing for these two small children. Yeah, I bet. And so very frequently, it was just like, Quentin! And then I just don't turn around. It's like, Quentin, turn around! Why'd you cut your hair? You look bad! <laughs> <laughs> well, well, this is also, for years, Audrey could only remember the real names of two members of Twerp, uh, Meowch and Hav Hogan. And the other two were just throwing a dart. <laughs> and they'd been over to our house many, many, many times. And it was starting to get very embarrassing <laughs> that Audrey could not remember Lord Phobos and Dr. Sung's real names. But it was always a joy to watch her try to guess them. <laughs> child trying to figure it out sorry and by real names i mean they're human aliases their real names are of course lord phobos dr song have hogan and commander meowch does she still call him kitty oh yes audrey calls commander meowch kitty and in fact they're having a facetime date tomorrow oh my gosh are they gonna do some lego i think they might try to get some nintendo action on i don't know <laughs> Cool. Maybe some Mario Kart, although Meowch is very good at Mario Kart, so that's not the best combination. Meowch is a little frustratingly good at a lot of games, including Dead by Daylight, where I just feel like a scrub every time I play with him. Yeah, well, now try being six and not good at video games. <laughs> uh, My third peach is that Mars looks fucking amazing tonight. I think it's like the closest slash brightest Mars is going to be in a very long time. And if you go out and look at it, I don't even know if it's still up, but Audrey and Rachel and I went out earlier today. It's this big fucking bright red dot. And it's very visible and it's very red. Shit. So, yeah. Sounds like me fucking looking in the mirror in the morning after falling asleep on my makeup. <laughs> oh, got him. Nice. It's the incisive humor and fighting wit that you guys tune in for. Thank you. Yeah, which direction do I look? It's not quite due east, but it's close to it. If you look east... A little bit above the horizon, you can see it. You, you got to go look for it because it, it rules. And also, Jupiter and Saturn are visible, very visible tonight, too. Yo. Uh, and they're like right next to each other. It's it, it's a great night for planets. So it's obviously more. It's like big and red. It's right there. And then Jupiter and Saturn are there, too. It's it's great. Lovely. Cool. I'll have to step yeah. outside and open my peepers. Yep. We walked out to see him. And Audrey is now into basically rhyming couplets where she'll just be walking around the house and a normal thing is like she starts the rhyme and often finishes it with actual words, but just as often finishes it with, uh, you know, gibberish. So she'll be like, we're walking down the street to see Mars and I hope that we don't see any glars. <laughs> and she's just like walking down the street, proclaiming this like running commentary kid babble as we're outside looking for planets. And often she will do it in a, a fancy accent, which is basically her attempt at a British accent, which is, let's just say, it's the cutest thing you've ever fucking seen. Is Audrey in training to become like a gremlin under a bridge? Oh my God. A costume weary travelers <laughs> with couplets or alternately is going to go on to write Finnegan's Wake or something? I mean, it certainly seems like that. The other thing she's been doing recently, which is really my favorite thing, is we've been playing Mario Galaxy, which is now out for the Switch, of course. And while the music is playing, she does this with every video game, she will sing about the game to the tune of the music. So, you know, Link is walking through a cave. There is a chest and he's going to open it. it like that kind of stuff. That's really cohesive. She like tells the stories while she's doing it and she gets the melody and the rhythm and it's very, very cute. But sometimes it's just like, you know, Mario, 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 Mario. <laughs> Mario, 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 you know, stuff like that. Gamer. It's ugh, it's so great. I, I, I keep meaning to record her doing it. I did a similar thing. My favorite was, I, I think we've talked about these on the show before, but the series of like, I guess they still make them, but they're not the same. The point and click uh, Nancy Drew, her interactive adventure games. Mm. 
that was my shit as a kid. I still like those. I, I've gone back and replayed a few of them and they're just extremely charming. The theme song like really fucking slaps. Um, and the my dad and I would play them together and it'd always just be like, my name's Nancy and I'm a detective. <laughs> and you can die in those games a lot. Like there are a lot of ways you can fucking die. Usually that would devolve into us just listing the ways that she's breaking the law and also getting killed. That's awesome. Rachel and I used to do a bit and I feel like they might have done this like years after we were doing it on Family Guy, where the idea is it's like John Williams lyricist. And he's like, all right, Steve, here, here's my idea for the Jaws theme. It's got these great lyrics. It goes, Jaws is a shark. Jaws is a shark and he's swimming in the ocean, you know, that kind of thing. And we would do these bits where we would put lyrics to john williams scores and i think i feel like i saw this bit on family guy or something because it definitely feels like a family guy cutaway anyway i'm a professional comedian listen who hasn't laughed at a family guy joke at least once yeah this episode was bonkers yes um jarek good luck good luck we're all rooting for you we're also getting this to you as late as we've ever gotten to you an episode. Yeah, so. you're right. We're also going to record a mini immediately after this, which is both of us like on our sharpest like mental acumen doing the New York Times crossword. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's too bad I already fucking crushed spelling bee today. What? Oh Genius. god, damn it! You already did the spelling bee. Fuck. I forgot. I forgot we we're doing it. But yes, it's disgusting. Ah, <sighs> uh, shit. It's October thirteenth. <laughs> <laughs> And if me, I think me bumping the mic while saying what day it is, is pretty, pretty representative of the whole situation. But like, hey, folks, shit's kind of weird right now. And by kind of weird, I mean very bad and everything is on fire. And so this is me saying that I need you to go vote for Joe Biden. If you like democracy, listen, I'm not stoked about Biden. I don't think any of us are like super like fucking hype about Biden. Who was your pick? Who was your pick? Who was my pick? Take a wild guess. I could see you being one of several, but I mean, look, I was Elizabeth Warren all the way, personally. Really? Oh, yeah, big time. I think she's the best. I love her. Were you Sanders? Yeah, yeah, big time. I would rather have Elizabeth Warren over Sanders any day, personally. Interesting. Oh, boy, we're getting some spicy politics chat. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, regardless, I'm not stoked on Biden or Harris. But I am stoked on people maintaining their basic human rights and also hundreds of thousands of people not dying, please, God. So vote early if you can. Fucking drop it off. Stand in line as long as you need to. There's a lot on the line here. Take care of yourselves, please, because shit's crazy. And, you know, be kind to those close to you. And uh, remember the peaches right now, because I know we're all really really fucking freaked out and stressed and I'm watching CNN way too much and I hate that my brain has warped so bad that the moment in the evening where Chris Cuomo throws to Don Lemon and they're like, hey brother, how's it going? Like that really is a highlight of my evening. So please vote. This is the end of the podcast. Good night. Good night. Late and Night is produced by Brian Wecht, Leighton Gray, and Jarek Centeno. Follow us on Twitter at Leighton Knight, on Instagram at Leighton underscore Knight, or email us at LeightonKnight at gmail.com. <laughs>